Pakistan, which means the nation of the pure, clean, or holy. But in reality, it is the polar opposite, riddled with hate, fear, hostility, or unreasonable obsession. It is the region, in which terrorists have complete freedom of movement in some places. In certain areas, the Pakistani army fulfills the same function, as the country's terrorist organizations. It is a nation, in which ministers applaud attacks on parliament, by terrorists. Its former Prime Minister, terms Osama bin Laden, as martyr. Pakistan, which is an artificial creation, came into being, as a direct result of its hatred, for Hindus. It is a nation, in which members of religious minorities are converted, against their will, and where the legal system is unable to provide, any kind of justice to those who have been wronged. It wants Kashmir, but has given part of Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, to China, in exchange for friendship, since they are such good buddies. The nation practices, no secularism, but the rulers of this country, is always eager to lecture others, on the need of secularism, and protecting the rights of minorities. Not just in India, but also in France, Imran Khan, the country's former Prime Minister, has delivered lectures, on the topic of how to properly treat members of minority groups, to Emmanuel Macron, the President of France. Let's start from the very beginning. When Pakistan was launched, in 1947, by its so-called secular founding fathers, they had the goal of establishing, a homeland for the Muslims, who lived in South Asia, rather than an Islamic state. It was Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who came to be known as Pakistan's Quaid-e Azam, or, Great Leader, who made it very apparent that non-Muslims would be treated, as equal citizens, in the newly formed nation. On the other hand, Pakistan's path, since gaining its independence has been considerably different. When India and Pakistan were split up in 1947, millions of Hindus and Sikhs, went to India, and millions of Muslims went to Pakistan. The partition led to the biggest movement of people in history. At least a million people died, in mass killings. Tens of thousands of homes were destroyed into, and burned down. There were tens of thousands of lost, and abandoned children. The rioters also raped, and took away between 75,000 and 100,000 women. But, those occurrences are ignored, and Pakistan commemorates its birth, as a triumph against Hindus, emphasizing Muslims, as victims. Now, if this is your greatest accomplishment, you must ensure that the slaughter is depicted to future generations, as being conducted by Indians, Hindus, and Sikhs. In short, India is their adversary, and they have to imprinted this, on their future generations. When India and Pakistan got their independence, they were at the same level of development. Both exchange rates, and the amount of money in reserves, were about the same. But starting in the late 1950s, there was a clear change, in how things were run. In 1955, at a meeting in Avadi, the Indian National Congress, is known to have passed a socialist resolution. In 1958, General Ayub Khan, led Pakistan's first coup d'etat, which toppled the country's new democratic government. These changes, didn't necessarily make a big difference, in the economy right away. But they did set Pakistan up for a growth spurt in the 1960s, when India was having trouble with droughts, a falling currency, and wars in 1962 and 1965. India was stuck with an old socialist economy, trunk dialing, and black and white TV, not to mention old models of ambassador cars. Pakistan, on the other hand, had the latest consumer goods and cars. At the end of 1970, Pakistan's per capita GDP, was almost 1.5 times higher, than India's. And it could get more money, from Western economies than India, whose government, led by Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, was taking over a lot of private assets. So, after that, what happened to Pakistan, and India? In the 1990s, things started to change again. India liberalized, and Pakistan, radicalized. India began to make, scientists, while, Pakistan began to make, terrorists. Pakistan has a history of bringing up Kashmir, in international forums, without much success. Though Pakistan's floods have damaged, its debt-ridden economy, with no relief in sight, its officials remain obsessed, with Kashmir. And has often expressed false worries, over the ill-treatment of minorities, in India. 
Bilawal Bhutto Zadari, the 37th Minister of Foreign Affairs, has made similar bogus concerns. He further chastised the BJP-led administration, accusing it of promoting Islamophobia in the nation. In response to the false accusations made by Pakistan's Minister of Foreign Affairs on minority groups in India, India provided a resoundingly decisive response. India, while speaking at a United Nations high-level meeting on the rights of minorities, referred to Islamabad's allegations as the most ironical, because it is due to the fact that reports of minority killings and suppression are quite common in Pakistan. Srinivas Gotru, India's Joint Secretary of United Nations Economic and Social, responded strongly to the comments made by Pakistan's Foreign Minister, Bilawal Bhutto Zadari. He stated that it is ironic that a country with the worst track record in terms of how it treats minority communities is lecturing India about the rights of those communities. Excellencies, India is a multilingual, multi ethnic, and multi religious society. The cost. Let's see how Pakistan treats its minority. India, where it is possible for a Muslim or a member of a minority to become the country's president. It is not possible to make the same statement for Pakistan. Former PM Imran Khan has been vociferous in his attacks on India, arguing that New Delhi denies Muslims their basic rights and is trying to shift the demographic of Muslim majority Kashmir. In his own National Assembly, the majority voice blocked minority member Dr. Naveed Amir Jeeva's bill, arguing that only a Muslim may be president and prime minister in Pakistan. Almost 23% of Pakistan's population was comprised of non-Muslim citizens. Today, the proportion of non-Muslims has declined to approximately 3%. A daily in Pakistan, the Express Tribune, lists some of the country's most major incidents on minorities since May 2013. This story, from the Express Tribune, has documented evidence of many attacks not just against Hindus and Christians, but also against the members of the Ahmadiyya community. Hindu temples destroyed. Protesters set ablaze more than 200 houses belonging to Christians in Joseph Colony. Enraged Muslim mob beat a Christian couple to death, etc. Maybe the article is outdated since it was written and published in 2016. But the number of attacks against Pakistan's religious and ethnic minorities has skyrocketed between the years 2016 and 2021. Imran Khan vowed in his 2018 election manifesto that his party will protect the civil, social and religious rights of minorities. He also said, I want to warn our people that anyone in Pakistan who targets our non-Muslim citizens or their places of worship will be dealt with harshly. He said, minorities are just as much a part of this country as anyone else. But, during his time in office, from August 18, 2018, to April 10, 2022, at least 31 people from minority groups have been killed and 58 others have been hurt in targeted attacks. Minorities have also been charged with blasphemy 25 times, and their places of worship have been attacked at least seven times. Last year, a group of workers at a factory in eastern Pakistan beat and burned a Sri Lankan manager for what seemed to be blasphemy. Prime Minister Imran Khan called the attack horrific and said it was a shame for the country. Investigators for the police considered that the attackers had said the manager had committed blasphemy because he had taken down a poster with Islamic holy verses on it. When Pakistan established a distinct nation in 1947, Hindus, Sikhs, Christians and Parsis became second-class citizens. Hindu Sikh minority have been attacked in Pakistan and forcible conversions became common. One of the biggest stories in Pakistan in 2020 was about a Christian teenager named Arzu Raja was abducted from outside her home in Karachi's railway colony in broad daylight. The local police said that she chose to become a Muslim on her own and has now married the 44-year-old man who abducted her. But the girl's parents said she was forced. The Sindh High Court also said that Arzu's marriage to her kidnapper was legal. Same incident happened to Rinkal Kamari. She was kidnapped with the help of a lawmaker from the ruling party. She was forced to get married and become a Muslim. This is just one case of a Hindu girl being kidnapped and forced to change her religion in Pakistan.
According to a report by the Asian Human Rights Watch, 20 to 25 Hindu girls are kidnapped and forced to change their religion every month in Sindh. Pakistan has no rule of law to defend these populations' rights. Over time, varied degrees of violence, cruelty, and prejudice were reported, but no fast action was taken against Pakistan's minorities. Even Christian and Ahmadi graveyards have not been spared. Regular news and community reports detail cemeteries being dug up and damaged. Blasphemers have been burned alive outside police stations without being recognized or punished. It is either now or never for the world to respond to such crimes. And Pakistan must stop lecturing India and start fighting for justice for its minority population immediately.